Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Khalil Doheny, and I'm Director of Content Marketing at Digital Niche Agency. Today, we have Kevin Wolf from Wind Harvest. Kevin, how are you doing today? Good. Thank awesome. you. And while people are trickling in, Kevin, do you want to just give a background to yourself and really lay out the land of what we can expect from the webinar today? Sure. Uh, I'm the CEO and, and a co-founder of the company, and um, we are going to go through a set of slides that kind of give you the basics of each of the key areas of the company. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the slides. I've been cautioned, no, let them do more questions. So you can make little notes yourself and and uh, ask those questions. And Khalil will tell you how to go about um, doing that. But I'm really looking forward to this opportunity to share with you what, what we're going to be doing for the world and our investors. <laughs> awesome. And yeah, we're going to go through a whole presentation um, shortly here. And then we're going to leave some room uh, at the end for Q&A. If you have a question, there's a Q&A chat box below. Uh, feel free to ask your questions there. And yeah, just to remind everyone due to SEC guidelines, there are some questions we are unable to ask and answer on this webinar. So if you have any questions around uh, deal terms, future projections, uh, use of proceeds, feel free to send us an email and we'll redirect you to where you can get all that information. With that being said, Kevin, I'm gonna pass the mic back to you. Well, good. Well, thank you, Khalil. And, and, um, and also Jen Hoover, who's on staff and she's been helping um, us uh, prepare for this. Um, so I'm glad to be uh, ready to go. You know, my personal motivation for making this, uh, helping this wind turbine technology come to market is because I, I'm very worried about climate change and my grandkid and my and the world and, and nature and know that we really need to be doing something big. And the biggest thing I can do with my time and effort is to bring this technology, long wanted technology to the market, because it is going to, you know, uh, make a, a, a major difference in the world. And at the same time, it's going to hit a home run for our investors. And I have a lot of family and friends and others who have invested over time. So I definitely want to do well for them. Um, so the company has always realized that the turbulent wind near the ground is a problem for the traditional propeller type horizontal axis wind turbines. That turbulence shakes their blade. The blade um, goes up to a horizontal drivetrain and those bearings start to shake. And the next thing you know, they need to go up and bring in a giant crane to go 200, 300 feet in the air and remove that whole section and replace it. And that is a very expensive. So they spread their turbines far apart from one another and raise them high above the ground to avoid turbulence. This is a $400 billion market in the existing wind farms. And we can show you the analysis on that. I'd be glad to explain to you actually how we came up with that. We spent basically 10,000 wind farms we analyzed. Um, this next, uh, um, uh, now I want to introduce you to um, Deborah Burchett. She is the executive director of the Sam Francis Foundation. And I want to kind of do a homage and honor to the founders of the original Wind Harvest Company. And the dream that started this company um, is a dream that I also kind of uh, smitten me, and I wanted Deborah to kind of tell this story. Deborah, thank you for being here. Well, thank you for having me, and and we're so excited that Wind Harvest or Wind Star, it has many names that ha it has gone through over time, but um, is still alive and doing well and growing and expanding, and and it's so exciting to us. Many of you may not realize that it was founded um, by the abstract expressionist painter, Sam Francis, who is celebrating, actually, we're celebrating his 100th centennial this year. He was born in 1923 and passed away in 1994. And I represent, I'm the, the president of the foundation that is still uh, working on the, his legacy and doing many educational projects, still uh, supporting um, the company that Kevin's working with, um, as well as um, exhibitions for the artist's work. We just had a big show that opened at the Los Angeles County Museum this year. And so 
Sam Francis as a painter um, was the kind of artist that felt that he belonged to the world and he wanted to do things to the world. He was very environmentally conscious, very much interested in science as his father was a mathematician. He um, grew up in the Bay Area and um, he was one of those kind of people that limits and judgments and attitudes about life um, were not, you know, were not, he was not one to be characterized or to stay in one shallow uh, niche for his artwork. And he was also very much involved in all kinds of causes, including uh, environmental causes, medical research uh, causes. He started a publishing company for literature and poets um, and all kinds of other different uh, projects that he was involved with, um, including buying land for reserves um, so that nobody could grow, you know, grow a uh, build on them. And he actually had told his father in 1961 that he was the kind of person that wanted to be a leaf in the life wind. And so already early on in the 60s, he even used the word wind, which I think stayed with him. Um, and as time went on, he met, he met um, two people in the Los Angeles area at some um, uh, Jungian seminars that he would go to. And that's Sam Francis in the center there. And Bob Thomas is on, on his right and George Wagner's on his left. George is with the tie. And um, they were, George was the lawyer um, and Bob was the engineer and Sam was the dreamer. But in fact, they were all dreamers. And um, so the story goes that basically uh, Sam, Sam met these people and they sort of had like, they were, they thought a lot about certain things, but that George, um, Bob Thomas, who is in, in the blue shirt, he um, had a dream in 1975 of a five pointed star, like an object. And, um, but there was more to his dream and the dream is something that Sam picked up on. And so he came to George Wagner and some other people and asked them to sort of think about supporting Bob's idea of funding something um, that was environmentally um, going to help with the wind, with the, his wind turbines. So Sam put in a lot of money and um, he also helped raise funds in many ways. And Bob Thomas was actually, he had, he was working for a government job and the state of California. And he also actually did some work with um, Governor Brown with, his, with the state in, in terms of energy research. But he left his job and started basically Wind Harvest. Um, and so Bob, and George Wagner in the center and Sam Francis, the artist, uh, formed a, a corporation and they uh, eventually obtained a patent on the wind turbine. And Bob called it the wind star turbine and Sam continued to fund it for many, many years, um, raising funds and putting a lot of his own money um, into it. And they made some small models in Southern California. Hey, eventually. Uh, hey Deborah, Deborah, yeah. I'm gonna have to cut you off there. Because Why? I'm going I'm to talk more about the actual technology. Okay, the Sandberg Mountain and everything. Yes, yeah, all okay. that stuff. So let me deal with that. All right. Um, but that, you know, one of the things that uh, Bob, uh, my, my part of the story was a, a reoccurring dream. And that when he had on the first night of that Hyungian retreat, he had to tell it to everybody at the retreat. And a recurring dream like that is, is a very powerful thing in people right. who believe in the philosophy of Carl Jung. And right. that dream you know, that you would solve it by creating a wind turbine. And the key is this picture behind uh, them. That is the Windstar 480. There are stators, those kind of columns that are aerodynamically shaped. They're on the points of a star. And the wind can come in from any direction and the blades are inside and they will get a larger amount of wind. It'll do, it just did amazing things. One of the last things that, uh, that Sam Francis funded was this model uh, 1066. If you look over here on the right, that's Bob Thomas looking up at one of the columns in the points of a star. 
That's the Windstar 1066. And there's a blade inside there. And he noticed that there was a lot of damage being done to the stator on one corner of that rotor as it went around. And he hypothesized, oh, there's a speed up effect. I'm an aerodynamic engineer. I understand this stuff. The wind is speeding up between that stator and that blade. And that gave him the most important legacy that Sam Francis, George Wagner, and Bob Thomas, in my opinion, gave the world. And that is the coupled vortex effect. So unfortunately, Sam never got to see these three turbines. Yeah. They were installed in Palm Springs. They're actually still there. They're not operating, though. Bob in, uh, installed the center turbine, um, kind of built on a, a version that we had before, but there's guy wires and no stators. So it's not called a Windstar turbine. He operated it for a year, collected wind speed data and energy output data. And then I was kind of helping with a company, trading my Wolf and Associates uh, time and labor for, for shares in Wind Harvest Company. Um, and I came down and helped them install the two turbines next to the center turbine. And then they collected data on all three turbines and the center turbine doubled its energy output, its efficiency in the low wind speeds. And that led to the coupled vortex patent given in 2004. It led to a California Energy Commission grant that spent $50,000 modeling the effect and came to the conclusion, yes, this is absolutely amazing breakthrough in the world of vertical axis wind turbines with the couple of vortex effect. Bob had, and his son, Dean, had figured out how to make the vertical axis wind turbines as efficient as the horizontal axis turbines. And because we knew that there is a um, uh, big, uh, 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 anyways, let me go to this slide. So I'm going to jump ahead. To, after 2011, that report came out we got our series A round. And with that, we were able to install this three, the first three bladed turbine. And that was done off, believe it or not, in, in, uh, off the coast of Finland, um, because there was a big market for renewable energy, small turbines then. And anyway, so we, we got that one through technology readiness level five. And then the engineers, by this time, Bob had and was no longer working for the company, came up with the first cantilevered turbine. That, Technology Redness Level 6. And that is a full-scale replica or full-scale prototype. And that collected data. It had some problems, but we brought in a guy named Dr. David Malcolm, who brought in his aeroelastic model, and we figured out how to what the problems were. And that led us to this second one, a full-scale prototype in industry conditions. That's down at the UL Wind Turbine Testing Facility in Texas. And in 2022, it completed technology readiness level seven. And that, it led us to the engineers looking at that, what they learned from that, how to assemble it, all this stuff. And they came up with a breakthrough. And that is our model 4.0. That is now ready to go through certification right next to that model 3.1 in Texas. We've got everything lined up for it from except for the capital, which is what the purpose of this call is for. So, and one of the things that came out of it is new technology. And I'll go into it more, but basically a, a patent on the blade and a patent on the way the blade connects through a hinge to the arm and a fairing, how you put a fairing on that arm and then how the arm connects to the mast with another hinge. And then the mast is hexagonal. And you can bolt things on, and then you can actually use braces instead of cables. And we got patents on pending on all of that. And it is going to be lead us to the ability to go into this huge wind farm market where it's very turbulent. In the 20% of wind farms that have excellent wind speeds around the world, it is very turbulent. And it needs a technology that has hinges, that has the capacity to do it. And our modeling says that we're going to see a 70-year life of these turbines. And that opens up a $1.2 trillion market. So that's where we're very excited about. One last thing about that market is the wind turbine, the wind farm owners, they already paid for the land and the roads, the infrastructure. They get to double their lease income by adding our turbines underneath. And the studies out of Caltech say that our turbines will increase the output of the tall turbines by 10%. So they get a little sweetener right on top of it. So there is every wind farm owner we've talked to wants our turbines 
in their wind farms. But it takes a little while to get there. So we're opening up with a distributed energy market. And that is really places where the tall turbines can't go because they interfere with radar and air force bases or the telecommunication towers on ridge lines, or they're too tall for properties in very windy areas. Or on islands like Barbados, they just can't fit onto the roads or they can't fit into the properties. So these markets need a short turbine like ours. When we start the turbine sales in 2024 and 2025, we're only gonna make about, well, I shouldn't say only, because the tall turbine companies are making 10 to 15%, but we'll make a 20% margin in 2024. And then as we grow and the number of orders and the price drops, we can increase our margin. And we expect that somewhere out in, uh, when we're selling to wind farms, we'll be making closer to a 30% margin, which is gonna be the major income source for the company, except for licensing our patents. And that is this, um, the, the big uh, potential is these other companies will want to come into this huge market and they will need our turbines, uh, our patents. And that is the biggest barrier to entry and is the need for hinges and the need for super strong extruded aluminum blades. And we are going to, it would be difficult not to utilize our patents and our aeroelastic modeling to get into this market. So we're quite excited about that. For example, that, that uh, column, go back one, Jen, is that that thing costs us almost $30,000, $32,000 to make for model 3.1. When we use a hexagonal mast, it drops down to $6,000. That is an enormous savings that no one's ever been able to figure out how to do a hex mast on a wind turbine before like ours. So that's one of the things we were excited about. Um, there is other competitors out there there's like Sea Twirl and Worldwide Wind are pursuing the floating wind turbine market. Uh, Xflow and Fairwind, they are in the 25 to 50 kilowatt market. They're not quite utility scale, and they seem to be wanting to put them on tall towers to escape turbulence. And they really never show them right next to each other uh, where it's also turbulent. And this last one is really a uh, heirloom is a kind of like a sail. Um, and it's very early in the technology process. It's got a big chunk of money from, uh, from Bill Gates but it is unlikely to ever be for the turbulent wind market. At least that's what our engineers look at it and say. So we are um, uh, gonna be the first to market uh, to the vertical, to the turbulent wind market. We don't know how long it'll be before other people get into that market, but when they do get into the market, they're gonna be like, oh, they need, they're gonna need to have our, use our patents to make their turbines work. We've got a great um, team. It's really our engineering team. It's where we've got the strength in. Um, the rest of the company is just like, how do you keep the company going while we try to figure out how to raise money? The need for, we'll eventually bring on a chief financial officer and a chief operations officer and all these other C-suite type people and, and staffing to build out the kind of huge company we think we will become. But there's no need to pay those folks now. And the lead investor who comes in in the, in the B round is gonna to wanna to have a say in who those people are. So in the meantime, we're just gonna get this turbine uh, through certification and we have got the engineering team, a very experienced engineering team to do that. With that, I will kind of wrap this up, you know, and to kind of uh, the core things here is that we, you know, we are the first to turbulent wind. We've got a lot of, of sales in our pipeline. It's easy to make these things almost anywhere, like in Barbados, where we think 50% of the labor for the fabrication and assembly can actually be done on the island. That's a huge benefit for a company like ours. Um, there, we have solid exit strategies, um, and people have told us they're interested in buying our company once we get through certification. Um, and we're going to make a real difference in climate change. We're going to really, our turbines and our patents are going to put more renewable energy into the ground than anybody ever projected to come from wind over the next decade. So I'm glad to be here. Thanks for, uh, for watching all this and I look forward to your questions. Thank you for that, Kevin. Uh, yeah, as Kevin mentioned, it is time for some Q&A. So if you have a question, please leave it in that Q&A chat box. Seen already a couple questions come in here. And just to make sure everyone's on the same page, we will not be taking any live questions. So if you have your hand raised, please lower your, your hands. Uh, and you have if you have a question, please write it out for us. 
The first question is, how does your technology stand out and how do you come up with the patents and how do they work so well? Oh, I love that question. Um, so there have been H-type straight bladed vertical axis wind turbines for a long time. And the core problem they have had, Lisa and talked to a lot of people who are in this business over the decades, is they've never been able to have a model that would predict when harmonic resonance occurs. And I don't have to remember your physics, but harmonic resonance occurs with any moving object. And if you get into a harmonic resonance, a thing flies apart. So many vertical axis turbines destroyed themselves because the engineers could not predict harmonic resonance in the design. And that's what David Malcolm brought to us, the ability to do that. And so that is the core breakthrough that allows, stands us out from anybody else. Okay, so then now you're going through prototype after prototype, right? You're learning so much when you build a 25 kW turbine off the coast of Finland, and then you build the first ever cantilever turbine in, in our company's history, and you make mistakes, and you learn from the mistakes, and you got a model that tells you where the mistakes come from, and then you get to do it again down in Texas, and you get to make another one, and now you go and you're assembling it, and you're getting to test it again and bring the data in. And in the process, my philosophy with the engineers is, is, hey, always iterate, you know, until the design is frozen. And if you have time on your hand and if you can come up with a new way or a better way of doing, just go for it. And so with that, and because we had time, because we were having difficulty raising money, um, and we had enough money to hire the Ion Parashivu, the company that worked with the California Energy Commission grant, to evaluate, well, what's the best blade shape? Oh, it's not the Naka 18 shape, it's the Naka 21, a little bit thicker. And that wider terabyte, well, where can, what's the biggest blade we can make anywhere in the world outside of China or Russia? Oh, that'd be step G in Germany. We can make a 600 millimeter blade. That's about two, a little over two feet wide. All right, now you've got that, you know that before we had to put a, a you had to epoxy a plate on our old blade, because where the arm connected to the blade moves 16 million times a year, two forces each revolution. So there's 30 million movements on that plate. That So you had to put a plate in there to protect the blade. Oh, with a new design and the what the engineers came up with, we no longer need to epoxy a plate. Oh, we get a patent on a patent pending on that blade. Oh, when you connect that, you can change the, the type of... Um, uh, a hinge that you connect. So we got a patent on that. Oh, we can change the the way the uh, the sheet metal fairing works. Oh, we got a patent on that. Oh, gosh, it doesn't quite meet the safety functions. We're stuck. Oh, well, we can put another hinge between the arm and the mast. Great. Now we got a patent on that and we solved these problems. So in trying to make the biggest size blade possible for extruded aluminum, the engineers came up with all these additional patents. And that is why it's like, okay, you're gonna make the biggest blade possible. You're gonna need to have our patents to be able to handle the loads that come with that level of efficiency. So it's quite exciting. I hope that answered the question. Thank you for that. And I just wanna remind everyone that due to ST guidelines, we cannot discuss deal terms. So if you have any questions around final uh, financial projections, or use of proceeds or how much uh, the company has invested. Unfortunately, we cannot discuss that on the webinar. If you do have a question, please reach out to us directly. Uh, we have a question here. If Kevin is the co-founder, who is the other co-founder and what is the connection between Sam's organization and Wind Harvest? Okay, so the, there was an original company, as Deborah said, formed in 1976 by Sam Francis, Bob Thomas and George Wagner. That's the Wind Harvest Company. I became an investor in the Wind Harvest Company in the 1990s. I started trading my company, Wind Wolf and Associates, time for shares in the year 2000. And there was, we got the patent, but we realized in 2004 for the coupled vortex effect, but we realized um, that the company needed to fix up 30, 20 something years of investment and difficulty with that. So the way that we, uh, we got a 97% vote of the shareholders to form Wind Harvest International. And Wind Harvest Company 
Sam Francis Foundation, which owns a lot of the shares uh, in the Wind Harvest Company, are shareholders in Wind Harvest International. And with Bob Thomas and George Wagner and I, we founded Wind Harvest International in 2006. So that's kind of the relationship between all that and, and why I'm a founder of Wind Harvest International. And Bob and George have passed away. Um, they've been at this for a long time. They were just instrumental in getting the company to where it is. Thank you. Um, what is the biggest risk to successfully execute the plan? Well, unfortunately, the, the risk for companies in our stage is that there are not a lot of venture capital funds or others who will invest in utility scale renewable energy hardware like ours. Too many renewable companies have failed and have lost those DCs a lot of money. So basically we spent the last year focused on trying to bring in lead investments a lead investor into a round, a larger round. And the answer was no. And we haven't been able to find one. So that's always been the problem. How do you have to get enough money? You know, the $3 million it'll take to get two turbines in the ground because we need to do a pair and get it through certification and keep the company going for another year while it takes to get through certification. Um, and so that's been the, the always the problem with a company like ours. So thankfully, there's a solution to this, um, and that's going after smaller investments. Um, so does that answer that question, Lil? Yeah, we're good there. And then another question here is, what types of inverters do you use that can handle the rapid voltage changes? Wow, that's a very great question. So um there is a product made by ABB out of Germany. It's uh, actually constructed in Illinois, um, up there, and it's a town up there. They have a factory. And that's where we get our, what's called a power converter. It's actually a variable speed motor that can also be used as a generator. So they sell it off the shelf all over. And we are able to make use of that for our turbine. So its capacity to handle the kind of surges, yes, you... You're right on target. There are huge power changes. So in Texas, in industry conditions, one of the things that happens down there is you can see the wind change 10 miles per hour in a second. Wow, the force that change on a blade of a rotating turbine is enormous. And that you have to have the right kind of inverter to handle the kind of an instantaneous torque change that comes with that kind of lift. And so we that's one of the... Um, companies we use, but the National Renewable Energy Labs has been investing significantly in developing a new type of power converter for turbines in our size range, between 50 and 100 kilowatts. And so there's a company in Pennsylvania that is anxious to test their prototypes on some of our turbines, which we'll let them do once they're certified with the ABB device. So there's a little background on, on our power converters. And of course, having the power converters made in the United States makes them available, eligible for the 48C tax um, credits that you get for buying products made in the United States, like power inverters. And is it fair to say that by choosing not to license the patents, others will be compelled to purchase your turbines, there, thereby creating a more profitable runway for wind harvest? Wow, that's an interesting question. The problem is, how do you handle the kind of demand in a, as a, a, a startup company. And the capacity to put in, let's just say you're gonna put in 300 megawatts out of the 3000 megawatts possible in the San Gagonio Pass near San, to, to near, uh, something, near Los Angeles, the San Gagonio Pass near Los Angeles. And it's 14 turbines to a megawatt. So that's 4,500 turbines. And that is an awful lot of machines to make and to bring together and the generators and all the component parts. So somebody like Mitsubishi or GE gets that order. They're going to be able to provide that order and, and, uh, and, and do very well at it. Whereas Wind Harvest, you know, we're going to be out there with lots of distributed projects around the world. We'll be working with places like manufacturers in New Zealand who want to capture the New Zealand market. 
But the big wind farm market is really uh, better taken care of by the largest manufacturers who can handle those kinds of orders and supply. And I, I'm happy with them building it out way faster. They'll make it so much faster than if we tried to do it all ourselves. And the world needs these things to come in quickly, not spread out over 20 years because Wind Harvest has patents and is going to do it all itself. So, and we'll make more money anyways, having them build it rapidly where we don't have to do anything. They just pay us a royalty fee. And then someone's asking, have you tried a GoFundMe or online other fundraising apps? Um, you want to talk a little bit about the uh, current crowdfunding campaign. Well, I can just tell you that we got through technology readiness level seven with this full scale prototype, right? We could not find it. If you can't find investors when you're at the edge of technology readiness level eight and certification, well, trying to get them to invest when you don't even have seven done. Um, and so that is where we went out to crowdfunding and we raised money through a WeFunder campaign. And you can go there and you can look up Wind Harvest and you can see a lot of information that came out of that. But that capital raise got us through technology readiness level seven. And uh, so that was our key breakthrough in how we figured out a way to solve this problem where the major industrial investors don't want to take the risk. And what are your wind speeds for a turbine operation and what percentage of the year you assume it will operate? Well, that is a, uh, varies greatly by territory. Let's pick two territories, Barbados. Barbados um, has trade winds. That means basically it's sunny in a part of the day and it's dark in the other part and it goes from the dark side to the sunny side. It's driven by heat and you have these winds moving across the Atlantic into the Caribbean and they're almost every day. They're pretty steady. Sometimes they get up to 20 miles, 25 miles an hour, and that's a lot. But we'll see it's less than it's between 10 and 20 miles an hour, and it's almost all day long, especially in the windier parts of the island. So that's great. You just run after sunset. They run all night. They slow us down in the morning when the sun's coming up, but solar can pick that up. And then they pick up again you know, around 10, 11 o'clock in the morning. Now let's go to another place like um, Solano County, where there's a thousand megawatts of existing horizontal axis turbines. You can go to our website, our library, and type in Solano, and you can read our report um, on the our, uh, analysis that we can bring 5,000 megawatts of vertical axis wind turbines into the Solano wind resource area. And so that is just a huge potential market for us. There, we got 10 years of Travis Air Force Base wind speed data uh, to every 10 minutes. And we put it together, got a very top level meteorologist to evaluate the data. And basically it shows that the wind speed from April through September runs almost every night of the summer. It starts around 12 noon when the upper valley heats up and the ocean winds come through the San Francisco Golden Gates and up the Sacramento River and right over the Solano County. And then it starts to uh, slow down at three or four in the morning. And so you can add solar in there and you can add batteries and you can charge up your batteries in the afternoon and release it after sunset. But you're also your winds going after sunset and you recharge your batteries again in the dead of the night. And then you release it in the morning when the wind has gone down and the, the solar has not yet picked up. So it's just an ideal little way place in which you can create a very steady supply. In the winter, when it is cloudy and the solar's not going, it's usually very windy. So they're complementary in that way as well. And what would be the actual lifespan for each one and how much maintenance would be involved for each turbine over, say, per year? Uh, okay, I love these questions. So the... Uh, when we made these um, turbine to be able to withstand turbulent wind and the engineers came up with the hinges and they have a very accurate model that comes out of Sandia National Lab. There's a fatigue life analysis part of that model um, that is out of the labs. And it shows that the weakest, the, sh the shortest lived component we have is the extruded aircraft aluminum blade, right? It's got 15 million revolutions a year, two pulses per revolution. It's expected to last 74 years. The, the galvanized steel tower, the galvanized steel rotor components, the, uh, the foundation, 
all of that will last even longer. So every 20 years, you have to replace the bearings on the generator and on the drive shaft. You have to replace the power converter. There's a small amount of fiberglass in the transition fairing. You'll have to replace that. You'll probably have to replace the pins in the hinges. And then the darn thing's ready to go for another 20 years. And then you do it again in year 40 and then again in year 60. Um, and so each time, um, at, uh, now I'll go to the maintenance issue. So uh, horizontal axis turbines have yaw mechanisms that move the turbine into the wind. We don't need that. Wind can come from any direction. We don't need a yaw mechanism. They have blade pitch mechanisms. So when the, the wind speeds up over a certain level, the blades have to pitch to shed load. We don't need that either. We don't have them. Our blades are stationary as they spin around. Our only maintenance is on cartridges, grease cartridges on the drive shaft and on the generator. Well, you know, cartridges are very easy to replace. And then the other replacement we need occasionally to do is the air filters to filter out the dust that comes into the nacelle. So that's it. It's really simple and it's near the ground. So it's much easier. We expect our maintenance cost to be half the cost of the tall turbines per megawatt installed. And I know during our practice session, we talked a little bit about the birds. Are birds a problem uh, as they are for, for large turbines? Well, there are certainly some birds that have difficulty seeing the horizontal axis wind turbines, right? They're a two-dimensional object. And the blade tip speeds are usually above 150 miles an hour. And birds do not evolve to see uh, horse, you know, two-dimensional objects where a thing's flying down from the sky or flying up from the ground and they don't see it. Whereas a vertical axis turbine is three-dimensional, especially with three blades. It looks three-dimensional and the ornithologists say that they are going to, the vast majority of birds should be able to see and easily avoid the turbines when they're spinning. The only study that has been done is on, in the Altamont Pass, where there was a two-bladed vertical axis turbine and the three-bladed horizontals, and it showed that birds were twice as likely to get harmed by the horizontal turbines than the vertical axis turbines. And then the scientists said, well, if you're not, if you're not doing two blades, but you're doing a three-bladed vertical axis turbine, you'll even be less problematic for birds. But still, we're going to add 24-7 motion detection technology to our projects. And we're going to figure out which birds <laughs> see our turbines and avoid them. And the ones that don't have trouble, we're gonna have that technology trigger a, a, a deterrent sound or lighting, or if need be to slow down our turbines until the birds pass and then they'll speed them up again. So we are pretty solid that we are going to not have significant impacts on birds and bats and wildlife populations. It's kind of the core culture of the company. And is there a Buy America requirement for building the turbine? If you want the 40% tax credit, yes. If you do not uh, build in America, you only get a 30% tax credit. Now, the amazing thing, that tax credit is going to last another nine years. And that tax credit is for... Um, the entire project, everything from the land acquisition to the preparation to the installation of the turbines and the foundations, the purchase of the, the turbines. So it's a big percentage uh, uh, and that you get back as soon as the energy starts produce, the turbines start producing energy, the developer of that project, the owner of that project gets a 40% tax credit back. So in the United States, that's going to be a huge benefit to everybody who buys our turbines, especially in the early times when we have to sell them for a higher price than we will later on. And that's the purpose of these tax credits is to help technologies like ours break into the market. So we're very grateful for the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act and these, these tax credits. It will really help. It's already really helping the renewable energy industry in the United States. And does the technology and design in your tur wind turbines allow for offshore deployment? Well, uh, we got approached many years ago by a, da uh, a Danish company that wanted to use our turbines on a barge and off the coast of Denmark in the Baltic Sea because they would get eight hours of wind and then they get eight hours of waves following the wind. And they wanted to put in the barge a device that would generate electricity when the barge rocked. 
And so the idea was, oh, our turbines on the top of that barge would produce energy for eight hours, and then the barge would produce eight and eight hours of energy from the waves, and then it would be a battery that would store the extra. And so they could create a 24-7 device. Well, I've always liked that idea. And uh, so I think that, yeah, we're, you know, small turbines for archipelago islands, for harbors, for places like that, but I don't think we'll ever be in that massive wind farm market offshore where they're building, you know, 10 and 20 megawatt machines. No, we'll be in a kind of more of a niche mar market on barges. And <clears throat> let's see, how did the logo evolve from San Francis to the one today? This is well, that's a good question. We, San Francis's logo, um, and I don't know if it uh, was, there's a, there's a video and I can't find it anymore of him actually making that logo. I think he made it in Japan. Um, and he, um, he spilled paint on a spinning paper. And as he spilled the paint, it moved in this market. And, you know, some people looked at it and said, it looks like barbed wire. Where people at me looked at it and says, oh, it looks like a sea turtle. And it creates different images. And so we succumb to the pressure of various people uh, who we have a, a lot of uh, influence in the company to say, yeah, you should get a new a new logo. And uh, part of me says, ah, bummer. But I'm also happy with our present logo. Um, and uh, so that's how it changed. It changed a few years ago with the start of the crowdfunding campaign. And then question you would like, how do we contribute? Do we contribute through the website? You um, follow the link to the Pick Me uh, crowdfunding page. And uh, do you have, Kelly, how are they finding that? Is there a link in the chat? Yes, there is, and I will add it again. Great. Great. Uh, and accredited investors can call me, send me an email, contact me, and I'd be glad to talk to you uh, individually. Awesome. And then another question here is, I was wondering about how many homes could be run off just one turbine, like max load of usage per family. Okay, so I'm going to use a different um, analogy than versus one turbine. Let's say it's a one megawatt project, which is probably the smallest project we'll make. And let's say it's in a uh, 15 and a half, 16 mile an hour wind speed, like down there near Rio Vista. And in that wind speed, that megawatt, those 14 turbines or so, will produce 3,000 megawatt hours in a year. Now, 3,000 hour, megawatt hours, the average home uses 10 megawatt hours, so it would produce enough energy that an average home in California uses 10 megawatts. If you were in Europe, you'd be around five megawatts. If you were in Africa, you know, uh, you'd be three megawatt hours. But in California, it's about 10 megawatt hours per home, 10,000 kilowatt hours per home per year. So that one megawatt, those 14 turbines would satisfy 300 homes with the energy that they needed in a year. Sorry, I, I like the math. <laughs> And let's see here. Do you use rare earth metals in your generators? If so, how will you address associated supply chain problem? Wow, boy, I like that question. <laughs> so we are presently buying our turbines from an Italian company called Soga. We, there's another European company that also can produce the turbine, the generators, I'm sorry. We're buying the generators from a company called Soga in, gener in Italy. They do use rare earth metals in their generators, and they get those rare earth metal magnets from China. So that is part of the China rare earth metal uh, supply. But we have contacts with a major international manufacturer and a company in um, the UK. Both of them are interested in working with us to produce ferrite generators. Ferrite is a pretty... Uh, amazing uh, magnet metal made of iron ferrite so it's abundant and it is and it, but it's bigger it is not so small it's not so compact and powerful so it takes a bigger size generator and the horizontal axis turbines have trouble with that because they don't like all the weight way up high 
but because we're short and close to the ground and we can actually put the generator on the ground and have a pipe extend from the drive shaft down to it, well, then we can use ferrite magnet generators. And those can be made here in the United States. And they can use ma magnets made in the United States or not made in China. So that is our, our next step. Yes, we're going to go buy the permanent magnet generators from SOGA. We've got that all lined up. Um, but, and that's what we used in Model 3.1. But we are going to move forward on creating a ferrite magnet generator to get away from the need for rare earth magnets. And then can you speak more on the California campaign? What, what do you think the California campaign? Yeah. Okay, let's do that. I think you mean the fact that we've done this research, mm -hmm. paid, paid a guy named Rich Simon, one of the famous meteorologists, to evaluate it. Um, and we've produced three different reports, one on the Tehachapi area, the San Gregorio Pass, and the Solano area wind resources. And we've come to the conclusion that 15,000 megawatts of vertical axis turbines can be added to the wind farms in California. Well, that's enormous. California needs a lot of energy. It needs both its offshore wind turbines, it needs its solar, and it needs to build out all that, all the energy it can make. And these wind farms are close to Los Angeles, San Francisco. They're kind of right there. They're not out in Wyoming where you have to make a thousand mile long transmission line to bring wind energy into the state. So what we think is going to happen is that they're going to build out these wind farms with our turbines, probably through the big companies, and we'll get our royalty license from that, and that they will probably put hydrogen gas production in most of them because there's so much energy. And to take that out by transmission line, it may not be very likely, but you can produce hydrogen gas, green hydrogen gas from that much wind energy and especially with technology that lasts for 70 years in those conditions. So that's what I expect will happen in California, that the onshore wind farms are going to become the major hydrogen, green hydrogen gas hubs for California with our, tur our turbines or off takes of our turbines building out the, the 15,000 megawatts of capacity here in the state. And are you expanding in wind farms outside of Texas? I've read interest what the governor of Wyoming has proposed for a sizable farm in that state. What is wind harvest growth strategy? Wow. Well, we we really love the wind speeds in Wyoming. We have one of our suppliers of parts to our tower is high country metals out of Wyoming. And so our intention is to break into that Wyoming market. The Wyoming market those people in Wyoming love their views and love their country. And there is resistance to building new wind farms out across their beautiful landscapes. But they can add our turbines into those existing wind farms and get great wind. So we think Wyoming is going to be one of uh, the biggest markets in the future besides California in the country. And then in this town, uh, in the city of Cheyenne, Wyoming, are places like the Walmart Distribution Center, the Lowe's Distribution Center, the Microsoft Data Center, these are huge energy users. And they can't put the tall turbines on their property, even though their wind speeds are over 15 miles an hour at 15 meters, 60 feet above the ground. So I, we're confident that they're gonna want our turbines to go onto their property to save money um, because they'll be able to produce the energy on the property itself. And the wind goes at night and all those centers run all night long and they need energy after sunset when energy becomes more and more expensive. Renewable energy does with solar. So that's why we think Wyoming is going to be a great place for us. And, uh, and we'll probably start with the, um, with the uh, distribution centers and the, the build-in on the existing properties and smaller projects, you know, 50 turbines, 80 turbines on one of those properties. I can't hear you, Khalil. There we go. Could these be used in residential areas as well? It's very interesting about residential areas. People do not like to live where it's windy. And people tell me all the time, oh, I live in a really windy spot. And we use Underwriter Laboratories Wind Navigator and we look it up and you go, yeah, your wind speed's only at like nine miles an hour, average wind speed. 
You were looking for sites with 15 mile an hour average wind speed. The energy in the wind is the cube of the of the wind speed. Oh my gosh, the difference between a 10 and a 14 mile an hour wind speed, it doubles. Between a 14 and an 18 mile an hour, the energy in the wind doubles again, kind of the nature of the cube law. So no, we we, we haven't found any residential areas that are so windy that they could use our turbines, but not very far away, like in Solano County, you know, three, four miles from Rio Vista or 10 miles from Fairfield, there's an enormously windy resource that they could tap on the ranch land there and bring the energy into their cities. But no, not where they live. And have you had any interest expressed by potential clients other than existing wind farms? If so, can you please give some examples? Yes. So we have, we pursued what's called an AFWorks Air Force uh, SBIR contract. And we got uh, MOU signed with two Air Force bases, very windy. And they are looking for alternatives to bring renewable energy to their Air Force bases without having to impact their radar. The horizontal axis machines, the very tall, big machines, negatively impact their flight patterns and their radar. So they are very interested in our turbines. So that is one of those Air Force bases is moving forward on, a, on a, a developing a pilot project, even though we, we got the SBR grant, but they did not fund us, they ran out of money. Um, so the, the Air Force bases are excited about that. So that's one. There is a rural electric co-op in Southern California that has got some great wind speeds in the heart of the district that, we, uh, ha that they have an interest in potentially producing wind energy in the middle of their district. They can't put tall turbines there. It's too close to their towns. It would interrupt their views uh, and all that stuff. But short turbines would do very well there. Um, what other, do they, want, do they want other examples? Um, yeah, if there were any other examples that you could add. Okay, so we worked with the US Forest Service down in Southern California near the town of Wrightwood to evaluate the placing our turbines right below the telecommunication towers on Frost Peak. And when we have more money, we're gonna proceed with a pilot project there. Um, and if that pilot project can be built out to the capacity that's on that ridge line, the town of Wrightwood, a few miles away, which is in a major fire area, can have its transmission lines cut down and it would still get energy from our project up on the ridge line. Right when it's fire danger in California, it's windy, and if they have to shut down the main transmission line coming into the town of Wrightwood, but a few miles away on the top of a ski resort, there is our turbines. Well, they'll get the energy they need when they have to shut down their main transmission line. So that's an exciting project. Um, don't know if we'll get it, uh, but we are certainly prepped to to uh, ready to to apply awesome. to the next step. <laughs> And while we start to wind down here, uh, Kevin, if you could give us three to five reasons why someone should invest into wind harvest. Well, I, th I think the biggest one is that it's a really rare opportunity for people to be able to invest in a renewable energy technology, utility scale, that'll be first to an enormous market, right? Usually what happens in companies that are at this kind of technology, they've been bought up before by a big company. In our industry, they, the, the big uh, turbine market companies have said, no, they'll wait till we're certified and then they'll try to buy us. And the wind farm companies, they wanna be agnostic on the energy so they won't invest in us. So we've been able to make it here without any big players coming in and buying us out. And that is just unusual that people can invest before the technology is certified and into sales. Because then what happens to technology like ours is the valuation skyrockets. And it's low before certification because it's a darn difficult thing to do. Now we're ready to do it. And that I think is the second reason we've done all the work, all the prototyping, all the modeling. We've got a great engineering team. We've got the patents. We're ready for it. And very few companies are ready. They get rushed into it. We would have been rushed into it if we didn't know about technology readiness levels and we should go through each of these steps. So that is, uh, I think, the other big reason. We're solid in our, our technology. We're solid in the market. 
Um, and we are um, we are definitely been here, and we are not going to quit until we succeed. Thank you for that, Kevin. And yeah, is there anything else you would like to leave the audience with before we sign off today? Well, there's, um, you know, just so much uh, bad news out there in terms of this climate change and that out of COP28, that it looks like we're going to be on oil for quite a while. And one of the ways to change the dynamics is to lower the price of renewable energy and adding our turbines that last for so long into the understories of wind farms around the world can help do that. And we can help make a major difference over the next 10 years in significantly increasing the amount of renewable energy that is made that was just unexpected. No one is planning on the development of the mid-level wind resource, the turbulent wind, but we'll help make that happen. And with investors like you, we're going to make a big difference in the world and we'll do very well for our investors um, is my prediction as well. Well, thank you, Kevin, so much for taking your taking time out of your day today to give us this presentation and to answer some questions. And thank you to everyone who attended the webinar. Uh, if you were on the webinar and had to hop off, don't worry, the webinar was recorded this whole time. Uh, I hope everyone has a great holiday season and yeah, hope everyone has a good one. Thank you very much for your help, Khalil. Of course. Bye, everyone. All right. Bye-bye.